Are you ready for Jesus to come today? Many times we talk about Jesus coming sometime in the future, and oh yes, I have a few weeks to get ready, I have a few years to get ready, I have time. But what if Jesus would come today? Can we be ready today? Our key text was found in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4, and it says, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Isn't that so beautiful? Our eyes and our ears have not seen or heard what God has prepared for us since the beginning of the world. Since Adam and Eve were created and they lived in Eden, besides Enoch and a few other people who went to heaven, we have not imagined or even thought of or even heard of the beauties of heaven. We are talking about a heaven where there will be no more viruses, a heaven where there will be no more unjust killings, a heaven where there will be no more riots, no more racial disparities, a heaven where there's going to be a river, the river of life, flowing out of the throne of God. And what is growing on either side of the river? The tree of life. And that fruit has how many different varieties of fruit? Twelve different varieties from that fruit. Delicious fruits, probably better than the best ice cream you ever tasted. From the tree of life, the tree grows on either side of the river. The streets are paved with gold there. It's a beautiful place. But more than, all, more than the beauty that is found in heaven, who will be there that we look forward to seeing? Jesus. Jesus Christ himself will be there. And I don't know about you, but I look forward to seeing him. I look forward to coming, looking at the, the scars in his hands, and... Uh, just sitting there with him, talking to him, worshiping at his feet, listening to him. Hugging, Hugging him, for sure. Yeah. Let's look back at history. Let's look at a lesson from Pompeii. I'm sure we've all heard of the city of Pompeii, <laughs> which was very well known for uh, being actually destroyed by, Mount, by the volcano that erupted from Mount Vesuvius. And uh, this, this uh, volcano, Mount Vesuvius, actually erupted more than 50 times. This is not a first-time thing, and um, there was a massive earthquake in the region around um, A.D. 63. So the volcano came in A.D. 79, and scientists later see that the uh, earthquake, the massive earthquake, was almost foretelling, or it was kind of leading up to that huge volcano that came about. And this, was, this could have been a warning for the people. But still, the people, you know, continued going to Pompeii. It was a vacation resort in the Roman Empire. Pompeii and the surrounding uh, area was a, a beautiful vacation area for wealthy to go and travel and visit. And um, so people kept on going. And then, even though Mount Vesuvius had erupted, it erupted once again. And uh, it says that the blast sent a plume of ashes, pumice, and other rocks and scorching hot volcanic gases so high into the sky that the people could see it for hundreds of miles around. The writer Pliny the Younger, who watched the eruption from across the bay, compared this cloud of unusual size and appearance to a pine tree that rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. Today, geologists refer to this type of volcano as a Plinian eruption as it cooled. So a huge plume of smoke went into the air with all this debris, and then it created almost like a, a massive mushroom effect. And it says, as it cooled, this tower of debris drifted to earth, first the fine grated ash, then the lightweight chunks of pumice and other rocks. It was terrifying. I believed I was perishing with the world, Pliny wrote, and the world with me, but not yet lethal. Most Pompeians had plenty of time to flee. Do you realize that? So they saw the plume of smoke go into the air. It created a mushroom effect, but it was not lethal yet. Ash started falling. People could flee. People had over one day to flee the city, and many people did flee the city. Thousands fled. The majority actually fled the city and were saved, but some remained behind. For those who stayed behind, however, the conditions soon grew worse. As more and more ash fell, it clogged the air, making it difficult to breathe. Buildings collapsed, but that was not what they died from. Then, a pyroclastic surge, a 100 miles per hour surge of superheated poison gas and pulverized rock, 
poured down the side of the mountain, swallowing up everything and everyone in the pass. So first they saw the smoke, but the actual volcano was not flowing down the mountain to them yet, or it hadn't reached them yet. They had a day to escape. By the time the Vesuvius eruption spluttered to the end the next day, Pompeii was buried under millions of tons of, vol of volcanic ash. About 2,000 Pompeians were dead. But the eruption killed as many as 16,000 overall, including the surrounding area. What is re it's really, really sad that people who were in the city, they were not trying to escape. They found people actually in the forms of what they were doing because the volcanic ash preserved their bodies. Yeah, their, their bones and skeletons were not there anymore, but they, they had like a, almost like a coating of ash around, like a sculpture around where their bodies were, and then they poured clay into there, and now they have sculptures of what people were doing. Yeah, some of them were in the fetal position. Some of them were taking baths. You still had animals. They had food in the street. They even found a preserved loaf of bread and some fruits, canned fruits that were still edible, that were preserved under all that ash. So the saddest part is that people did not have to die. For about the 2,000 people that were there, the 16,000 surrounding people, they did not have to die. They had a warning time. They could have escaped. But they did not listen to the warning. Why didn't they escape? They had known this was a volcanic area. They knew this, eru this had erupted before. They saw the smoke in the air, but they did not escape. They could have been ready, but they weren't. So Jesus is coming soon, and we all know that. There are warning signs around us, but are we seeing the warning signs? Do we take heed to them? Do we listen to them, or are we just going along with our lives, thinking, oh, this is going to pass. This is just some volcanic ash. And that's not too bad. I can keep on living here. This is a beautiful town. I don't want to lose my house. What if we lose our life? Jesus is coming soon. We have to be ready. When? Let's see. We'll find out. So our main points today is when should we be ready? Number one, when should we be ready? Number two, why should we be ready? And number three, how can we be ready? Matthew, 6, Matthew 24 tells us, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So let's say that you're waiting for someone to come at an unexpected hour, and you're going to have a test. They're going to give you a test as soon as they arrive. Do you want to start studying as soon as you see them pulling into the driveway? No, you want to be prepared for them to come. Jesus can come at an unexpected hour, at an unexpected time. We must be prepared for him to come. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he has said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. One year from now? One month from now? Tomorrow? Tonight? Now. When should we be ready? We should be ready right now. Why not? Why do we have to be ready right now? Let's look at some of these reasons why we need to be ready today. There are many reasons. I'm just going to briefly mention four. The first one is now is easier. It's much easier. The longer we wait, the harder it is. You think of people in the Bible like King Saul, for example, who disregarded the Holy Spirit's warnings to him and kept on living and disobeying, and eventually the Holy Spirit left him to the, t to the point where he went to talk to the witch of Endor for counsel. Second point is, tomorrow is not guaranteed. James 4.14 says, Whereas ye know not what it shall be in the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. Do we know if we will be here tomorrow? We may hope we will. We may think I'm pretty healthy, but what about things that happen? Car accidents, unjust killings. We have to be ready today. The third point is wasted years, wasted opportunities will take place if we do not give our hearts or be ready for Jesus today. Think of all the people you could have witnessed to and have told. Think of all the wonderful things you could have done, of the experiences you could have had with Christ. Benjamin Franklin once said, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Now, our fourth, fourth, fourth point is that playing with sin is very, very dangerous. 
it's too dangerous. Sometimes we think it's fun. Because the pleasures of sin, there are some pleasures of sin, but they're only la they only last a while. And the thing is, if you want to get caught up in the pleasures of sin, you can get too close to the edge and not return back from it. I want to give you an example of playing with sin that is too dangerous, or playing with something that is too dangerous. And this happened exactly one month ago. On May 7th, 2020, in South Carolina, there was a lady that was killed by an alligator because she decided to get a little too friendly, a little too close, try to take too many pictures. And this is what it says. Mrs. Covert was at her friend's house in South Carolina doing her nails and spotted the alligator in the front pond. Mrs. Covert reportedly spotted the alligator and was fascinated by the animal. She walked over to the pond and started taking pictures of the animal, at which point the friend warned about how she saw a deer getting attacked by the alligator at that same location, deputies said. I don't look like a deer, Mrs. Covert responded, before she reportedly reached out to touch the animal. It then attacked and grabbed the woman's leg, pulling her into the water. I guess I won't do this again, Mrs. Covert was heard saying after the alligator grabbed her, according to the police report. Her friend's husband came with a neighbor. They came with shovels and started hitting the alligator, but it wouldn't let the woman go. Police came and shot the alligator 15 minutes later. But by then, she had died not from the alligator killing her, eating her. She had died from drowning because he drugged her in the water. This lady was playing with sin. She thought the alligator was fascinating. Many times we think that sin is fascinating. We think, well, there's so many good games out there, so many nice movies I can watch, so many shows out there. It's, it's very, very fascinating for us. And we want to play with it. We want, to, we want to let it go on. But we can learn from this story. When should we, we be ready for Jesus to come? Now, today. Now, the second point is why should we be ready? Why is it a good idea? Why is it very important, the best idea for us to be ready for Christ's return today? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There will be a judgment. There are going to be two people or two persons that have to go before the judge, the guilty and the righteous. When you have a court of law, the judge sees two types of persons. He sees the guilty and the just. When you come before the judge, it is his responsibility of determining if you're guilty and what punishment do you pay. It is also his responsibility of determining whether or not you're innocent and if you should go free and have a pardon. And in heaven, it says here that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Will he find us guilty or innocent? Well, we are all lawbreakers. I've sinned. All have sinned. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We have committed crimes or sins worthy of death. We all have done, we all have committed sins. We have all done something that is worthy of death. When we come before the judge, we should be condemned as guilty because of what we have committed and should be condemned to death as a penalty of that. But none of us want to do that, right? We don't want to lose eternal life. Is there hope? There is hope. There is the possibility of us becoming the innocent party. Wouldn't that be nice? Imagine if you committed a terrible, terrible crime that was going to put you into prison for life. But you had the possibility of becoming innocent and escaping that. You had the possibility of someone taking your guilt upon them and letting, setting you free. We would all gladly, gladly take that opportunity. And I want to read some verses from Acts chapter 13 where Paul speaks to a Jewish synagogue 
in Antioch. And Paul, as many times, he would tell the story about Jesus Christ, his Savior, who redeemed him on the road to Damascus. And in it, in Acts 7, uh, 13, 37, 39, it says, But he, Jesus, whom God raised, again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, man and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So here Paul says that through Jesus there is forgiveness of sins and justification. We know in 1 John 1 verse 9 it says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and then to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. We know that. But what does it mean to be justified? Let's take a look here at the definition. It is the action of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. Did you see that in that previous verse? It says, but by him all that believe are justified from all things. Now, what does that mean according to this definition? If we are justified from all things. All of us, you and I, can be accounted righteous in the sight of God. Justification is the act of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. Wouldn't that be beautiful? How many of you would like that? So not only are we justified, but when we are justified, what happens? If we are accounted righteousness, what has to happen to our sins? They are forgiven. As we read, Jesus forgives our sins and he cleanses us. So justification includes forgiveness because here your sins are forgiven or taken away, but also... You, you are made to look as you have a clean slate. We are made to look as we have never sinned or committed iniquity in sight of God. When we come up before the court on high and our name is called forward and God opens the book and calls your name and says, John, Susie, Samuel, Dan, Catherine. And he opens up the book and he looks at your name. If you believe on Jesus Christ, it says you are justified from all things. So what does that mean when he opens your name? He's going to say, innocent. Next case. How can we be justified? How can we actually receive forgiveness of sins? We know that we are justified, but how are we actually made righteous? We know it's through Christ's blood. But there's actually more than that. So let's first look here at this verse in Romans 5, 9. It says, much net more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. So Christ, when he actually went unto the cross for us, he justified us. He gave us the opportunity to be justified, actually. Does that mean that when Jesus died, we automatically became justified? Did we automatically become righteous as soon as Christ died for us? But it says here, now we are justified by his blood. He shed his blood for us. Shouldn't you and I become justified automatically by his blood? If that's what this verse says? No, because we have to compare line upon line. Yes. Let's look at Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is his blood that justifies us. But how can we appropriate that blood to us? By faith. We have to believe that Jesus came to die for each and every one of us, to die for our sins, to give us eternal life. And then by faith, we can have eternal life through Christ. Do you have the faith that Jesus justifies you? Do you really believe that you can have peace and freedom from sin in Jesus? Are you struggling with sins? Are you struggling to surrender? The struggle should not be with sin itself. Do you realize that? Christ paid the atonement. The struggle should be with the surrender. We should struggle to give our hearts to the Lord. We should struggle on our knees to say, Lord, help me to stop trying to do this myself. Help me to let you do it. Many times we repeatedly repeat the same mistakes. Maybe we'll yell at our spouse, yell at our parents, our children, Maybe we'll say a harsh word. Maybe we'll get upset with someone, blow them off, raise our voice. 
Maybe we'll say the wrong word. Maybe we'll have lustful thoughts. Maybe we will slip into a previous sin, a besetting sin, an addiction. And then we struggle not to do it. You said, oh, I just messed up again. I got to do this. I got to stop this. I have to fight more. I, I keep on doing this. The Lord is coming soon. I have to be ready. We are justified by faith. We are not justified with our struggling to stop this. Jesus Christ obtained the victory while he was on earth. He was tempted by the devil in the wilderness of temptation, and he overcame on the same points that Adam and Eve were tested and on the same points that you and I were tested and are tested in. The Bible says he was tempted in all points, like as we are yet without sin. So the struggle should be to accept Christ's sacrifice, to believe in faith that he will forgive us our sins, but not only forgive us, but justify us, that he will give us victory over sin. Do you realize that? We need to actually get on our knees and struggle to surrender. We need to say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I've been striving for this so long. I've been trying and trying and trying, but I just can't do it. I need your help. Surrender means that we accept that we are helpless and that our only help comes from him. We give up and give the reins of our life to Jesus. Now, what will happen when we are justified? Philippians 3.9 says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Do you realize that when we are justified, God does not see our righteousnesses anymore because they're as filthy rags. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Do you know that you can be justified today? Do you know that you can be justified right now? You can be accounted forgiven. You can be considered pure right now in the sight of God, the judge of the universe. You can stand before God as if you never sinned right now. Do you know that? Do you believe that? These are not my words. These are God's words. When Christ forgives us, when Christ justifies us, when we through faith believe in his blood, it does not say, over many years you'll be justified. It says, and be found in him not having my righteousness, but his. Once we're justified, God looks at us and he says, wow, Joe, he's a perfect man because his perfection, his perfect character is through Jesus Christ. What will happen when we are justified? In, jo in John 15, 3, it says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. You will become clean, a clean person. Whereby are given unto you, unto us, in 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It says here that in 2 Peter that we can be partakers of the divine nature, of the heavenly nature. And through these promises, we can become partakers. We can share in the ability to have that divine power on earth. And through that, escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Do we need the power, the divine power? Do we need to be a, a partaker of the divine nature when we're in heaven? Do we need power while we're in heaven to escape the corruption that is in the world? No. How about after, how about after, right after Jesus is coming? Do we need the power to escape that is the corruption that is in the world through lust? No. When do we need the power to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? Today. Today. Right now. Do you realize that? Do you realize that right now you can be a partaker of the divine nature? Right now through faith. You can, through Jesus Christ, escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. When Christ returns, will his people be holy? Or will he change their characters when he comes? Revelation 22.11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. 
when Jesus comes, these are the words he, are gonna, he is going to say. He's not going to then turn you and make you holy. If you were not holy before, through Christ Jesus, his strength, you will not be able to inherit eternal life. Because when Jesus comes, our characters are set. Actually, not only when Jesus comes, when probation closes, our characters are set. When we miss the opportunity and probation passes, our probation. It might not be when Jesus comes. It might be tonight. If, if, I, were, if I were to lose my life tonight, my probation would end. As we know for the believers, there is a time of judgment, and there will be pro close of probation for each individual. There will be close of probation for the great multitude out there. People have had ample opportunity, ample time to give their hearts to Jesus. And when probation is closed, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. God will say, It's done. I've tried. I've given my only begotten Son, my dear Son, Jesus Christ, to die for everyone, that everyone through him might have eternal life. And now the choice is up to you. Now your choice, you have made your choice. You will suffer the consequences. It says in Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of the Savior shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Did you hear that? When the character of the Savior shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim, him, claim them as his own. Christ is waiting for his character, his spotless righteous character, to be perfectly reproduced in us. Well, how can that take place? I am a wicked sinner. How can that happen? Through his strength. We're going to see this as we go on, how this can actually happen. We know that when we give our hearts to Jesus and ask forgiveness for our sins, he cleanses us. But the unfortunate thing is that we keep on making mistakes again. We keep on sinning again. We keep on going down that old path again. Why? We'll see. And we'll see how we can maintain this perfect character through Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. When Christ comes, there will be a people. He's coming for a people that will not be sinning. Do you understand that? 1 John 5, 17 says that all unrighteousness is sin. He's not coming for an unrighteous people. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we are in Christ Jesus, you're not the same person anymore. You're not the same man or woman that you were. You become a different person. Let's look at this paragraph in Steps of Christ that says, since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. 1 Corinthians 10.13. That's where it talks about the way of escape. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. Notice that. You might think, oh, but nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody understands that I've lost my brother, my spouse. Nobody understands the financial difficulties I'm going through. Nobody understands the abuse that I've, I've suffered. Nobody understands this or that. Christ may have not gone through the exact trial that you've been through, but he's been through similar ones. And you know what it says? He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such or like we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us and now offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. He says, take off your, un your filthy garments. Take them off. I will cover you with my white robe of righteousness. But what do you have to do? If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior. Listen to this. 
then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, it doesn't matter how sinful your life was, it doesn't matter all the mistakes you've been, then for his sake you are accounted righteous. Do you believe that people like Hitler, people like Nero, people like Stalin, terrible wicked people who have committed terrible sins, do you believe that if they gave themselves to Jesus and accepted him as their savior, they would be accounted righteous in the sight of God? That's what it says. If they made that choice. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. By giving our lives to God, we become righteous right now through Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? As soon as you do that, God looks at you as if you have not sinned. Now, that does not mean that as soon as you, when you do that, your life stays in, as a pure slate. Because if we continue going back or repeating those sins or mistakes, if we continue disregarding the voice of the Holy Spirit, God will have to punish us again. We will be considered guilty once again. We saw with the Israelites, God had delivered them many times. He had forgiven them. They asked forgiveness. Then they murmured and complained again. What happened? Some more people had to die, unfortunately, because of their sins. So there is a penalty for sin, but if our sins are confessed, do you notice 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So let's say we confess our sins, we ask Jesus to our hearts, ask him to give us a new life, and then we go and sin again. Does our previous confession make us righteous for the future sins? No, because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, the sins that we have committed, you can't confess for future sins. If we confess our sins, then we, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Our third point is how can we be ready? A judgment date is coming. The time is ticking. The clock is running out. The signs of the times are telling us. And how can we be ready? This is probably one of the most important questions we want to ask ourselves today. How to be ready. And I want to briefly go over four points that the Bible brings out. The first one is that we need to watch. The second one is tell others, share the gospel. The third one is have the oil of the Holy Spirit with you. And the fourth is walk with the Lord. Let's look at what it means to watch. Mark 13, 34 to 37 says, be prepared, excuse me, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Jesus here gives the example of his coming as a man who went on a journey and left his servants in charge of the household. And he said he was going on a far long journey. And he told his servants and the porter, the gatekeeper, he said, watch. He didn't say when he was coming. He didn't say watch in two years from now. Watch only in the daytime. Watch on the weekends only. Watch only when you come to church. Does that mean we need to watch all the time, 24-7? Even at night, we need to be prepared. We need to have a connection with Jesus Christ. Watch. Jesus gives the warning. He goes on to say, watch, because you don't know if, Je if the master is coming back and even in the evening time, in the noon time, midnight, when the rooster crows in the morning. That's usually maybe 4 or 5 a.m. Or in the morning, you have to be prepared at all times. If you need to be prepared at all times for Jesus to come, we have to be watching at all times. We have to be ready at all times. And what does it mean to watch? We remember Christ when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went to pray with his, pray to his father, and he told his three disciples there, his three beloved, he told them something. He said, watch 
and pray, lest he enter into temptation. And unfortunately, what happened to them? They fell asleep. What did Jesus mean there to watch? Did he really mean to you know, look around, watch for something to come? Or what did he mean to watch? What does it mean to watch? Be ready, stay awake, be alert. If you are waiting, if you're in an army, let's say you're part of the U.S. Air Force, and you know an attack is coming, you are going to be ready and have your missiles ready. You're going to be ready for the attack. Because if you're not, you know what's going to happen if you're not watching? The same thing that happened in Pearl Harbor. When the Japanese came upon the United States in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and they bombed our United States air, air base there, when, naval base, excuse me, with, exactly right, the naval base, with the Americans being unexpected. Now, if they were watching, if they were paying attention, if they had, if they had spies or if they had other uh, satellites or airplanes paying attention to the moves of the Japanese and their airplanes and all their activities, they could have sent a telegraph back, they could have sent a message back and said, be ready, the Japanese are going to come to bomb Pearl Harbor. But they didn't. They were not ready. They were not watching. So being watch, watching means to be ready. And we see that here. This is what Jesus is talking about. Be prepared. Don't get distracted. Pay attention. If you're playing basketball or if you're playing a sport and someone says, watch now, I'm going to give you the ball. You, you better pay attention. Or if you, don't, you look this way, the ball might come and just whack you across the head. We have to be paying attention because it's the same thing with Jesus coming. If we're not paying attention, the Lord will come and will say, well, where did that come from? I, Lord, I wasn't ready. You didn't give me time. But if we were watching, we would realize that he's coming. How can we do this? We can ask the Holy Spirit to keep our minds focused on him. The second thing I want to talk about here is tell others about Jesus. It says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Preach the gospel. Give spiritual food to those around you. Tell others about Jesus. Zeal for God and his cause moved the disciples to bear witness to the gospel with mighty power. Should not a like zeal fire our hearts with the determination to tell the story of redeeming love of Christ and him crucified? Are you telling others about Jesus? Are you telling people that it's time to wake up? It's time to repent. It's time to get ready. There are thousands, millions of people out there waiting for us to tell them. But are we telling them? Jesus gave us a commission in Matthew 24, where he said, And this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. In order for Christ to return, we read that two things need to happen. The first was his character must be perfectly reproduced in his people. The second one is the gospel needs to be preached throughout the world. There are still thousands, probably millions of people who have not heard about Jesus, who don't know that he came to save them, who don't know that he came to die for them, who don't know that he came to give them eternal life, that they may also enjoy heaven and the beauties there and escape this world of sin and corruption. Are we preaching about Jesus? Are we telling about his love? Our third point is have oil in your lamps. I'm just going to summarize here. It talks about the kingdom of heaven being like unto ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. But the problem was in verse 3, it says, Matthew 25, 3, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. You notice here, it says the kingdom of heaven is likened to ten virgins. A woman in the Bible represents what? Church. A church. And a virgin? Purity. A pure church. So this is talking about when Jesus comes, it's going to be like there are ten pure women or churches or people within the church. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Now notice, they both took their lamps. What is the lamp? 
the word of God. Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But the foolish people did not take oil in their lamps. They did not have the oil of the Holy Spirit. So the foolish virgins, they had, the, they had their Bibles, they had their lamps. But without the oil of the Holy Spirit, without the su subduing, softening grace of the Holy Spirit, they were unprepared. So let's talk about our fourth point, walking with the Lord. We're all familiar with the story of Enoch in Genesis 5, 21 through 24, where it says, And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Do you realize here, Enoch did something in order to go to heaven. He did something to maintain his righteousness with God. What do you and I need to do to be translated like Enoch was? Walk with God. How many of you have gone walking with your friend before or your loved one? All of us have gone walking. Haley, when you go walking with your mom, what needs to happen? Can you go walking with your mom while, you're, while your mom's sitting on the couch? You both need to go walking together. Do you realize that when Enoch walked with God, what does that mean? They were together. He was with God. God was close to him. He felt his presence. He had a connection with God all the time. When Enoch walked to one place or another place, he felt that God was near him. Did Enoch actually see the Lord near him? No, but through faith, he knew that God was there with his angels, with the Holy Spirit. He walked with God with faith. And you and I also need to walk with God. It's not enough to just give our hearts to God. It's not enough just to surrender to him, to come to church on Sabbath, to study his word for devotions and worship. We must walk with God. Do you realize here it says that Enoch walked with God for how many years? 300 years. It doesn't say that Enoch walked with God only on the weekends when he came to church. And then the rest of the time he was with his family. It doesn't say that Enoch walked with God only in the daytime. Enoch, when it says that Enoch walked with God for 300 years, do you know what that means? 24-7, when Enoch would awake in the middle of the night, he would think of his Savior. He would kneel down and pray. In the daytime when he was working on his work, he would be thinking about Jesus. When he was tempted to do something or to say an unkind word to his children or his wife, he was thinking, that's not what Jesus would do. That's not what my Savior would do. It says in Hebrews, by faith Enoch was translated that he would not see death. Because Enoch had faith that God was there with him. It says in the spirit of prophecy that if you, if you and I actually felt the presence of the Lord near us, we would fear to sin. Are we walking with God? Are we walking with God or do we leave him behind? Do we just go off for a walk on our own? Unfortunately, we do many times. God wants to walk with us, just like he did with Enoch. We know that when he came to look for Adam and Eve, he would come and walk with them every afternoon. And he was looking to walk with them. And he's looking to walk with all of us. We may not physically see him, but throughout the day, we can walk with God. How can we do this? In the daytime, when you have a minute, read a verse, pray. You know, all the heroes of the Bible walked with God. Think about Daniel. He prayed three times a day. Think about Joseph. How do you think Joseph resisted the temptation from Potiphar's wife? He was walking with God. How do you think Abraham had the, had the ability and the courage and the strength to take his son Isaac to be sacrificed? Let's say Abraham did not have a connection with God. Let's say Abraham only walked with God on the weekends. <laughs> Let's say he only walked with God when he had his uh, prayer meeting. He only walked with God or he only talked to the Lord when he had devotions. 
Do you think Abraham would have a dream and hear the Lord and say, Abraham, go sacrifice thy son, the only son? He would think, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? No way. God wouldn't want me to do that. That's not God's voice. But how did Abraham recognize God's voice? He was in communion with him all the time. This was nothing new for Abraham to hear the voice of God in a dream. It was nothing new. The Lord talked to him. He woke him up that night. And he said, okay, Lord, I'll go. All the heroes of the Bible walked with God. When Noah was told to go build an ark, if Noah had not been walking with God, if he did not have a daily connection with the Lord, not only here and there, daily, all the time, when God said, Noah, go build an ark, Noah would have thought, you're crazy. There's no lakes, there's no rivers, there's no ponds. Maybe there was rivers. There's no oceans. They hadn't even seen rain before. And God said, go build an ark. There's going to be a huge flood. Noah recognized the voice of God. He did not question God. Abraham recognized the voice of God. All of these men, heroes of the Bible, recognized the voice of God because they walked with him. In order for us to be translated to heaven as Enoch was, as holy individuals without sin by Christ's righteousness and merits, what do we need to do? We need to walk with him. We need to walk with him. It's not enough to give our hearts to him. We need to maintain that connection with Jesus Christ each and every day. That means that maybe before you have your lunch, shut your office door, take a minute and kneel down and pray. By God's grace, I've been able to do that recently and it's such a blessing. When you have the opportunity and you feel some stress is coming on, you feel you're going to have a difficult thing coming up at work, shut the door for a minute, close your eyes, bow your head, and pray. And as we do that, as we pray more, as we read more, do you know what's going to happen? We will be guided by the Holy Spirit more. And instead of wanting to yell at our spouse or our children or instead of wanting to lose our temper, instead of wanting to lie, to think a lustful thought, whatever it might be, the Holy Spirit will tell us, that's not right. You just read that you shouldn't do that. You just prayed to Jesus. God will remind us. And we're going to maintain that connection again. I realize that the more we pray, or the more we have, and the more frequently we have a connection with God, the easier it is for us to avoid sin temptations and sins. The longer we give between praying, studying God's word, worship, you know what? It is easier and easier and easier to fall into sin. So if we do not want to fall into sin again after Christ has made us justified or cleaned or whole, after Christ has covered us with his righteousness, what do we need to do if we don't want to fall into sin again? Walk with God. We need to walk with God. The king of the universe is dying to walk with us. He has the opportunity to walk with each and every one of us, all of us listening. If the entire world, 7 billion people, wanted to walk with him, we could all stay connected with him 24-7. Our thoughts can be connected to him. We can send out a quick prayer to him throughout the day. We can read. We have the opportunity to read his word here. Instead of opening our phones to Facebook, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram, to look at the latest, hottest feeds or the latest news. Why don't we open our phones and said to read one verse? I'm not saying, you know, hours and hours we have to live our lives. But read one verse. Think about it and say and pray about that verse. Meditate upon it. Do you realize this is what Enoch did? This is how Enoch, amid the corruptions of that age, lived righteous. Do you realize that when God came, Sorry, when Enoch was translated to heaven, the world was more corrupt than now. God had to destroy the entire world, the entire race except for Noah's family in the time of Enoch. And Enoch remained faithful to God because he walked with God. He had that connection with God. So the result of walking to God, walking with God is found here. It says, the nearer we come to Jesus the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly shall we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and the less shall we feel like exalting ourselves. As we walk with God, it will be more and more of him, less and less of self. There will be a continual reaching out of the soul after God, a continual, earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the heart to him. 
we shall know that our sufficiency is in Christ alone, and we shall make the apostles' confession our own. I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. As we're coming to a close, I want to mention one brief reason why Jesus is delaying his coming. In 2 Peter, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are many reasons why Christ is delaying his coming, but why is one reason specifically? He's long-suffering. He wants all, all of us, all of us here today, all of those watching online, all of our online listeners who will be watching in the future, he wants you all to come to repentance. He's asking, he's pleading for us to come to repentance. And unfortunately, we don't want to. We want to hold on to these things of this world a little longer. We say, I love the pleasures of this world just a little longer. But we're losing salvation. I want to tell you a story of the Africans, the Bushmen, who live in the Kalahari Desert. They live in a desert and they obtain water. But there's no creeks, there's no lakes, there's no wells. But they get water. How do they get water? Two ways. There's a plant, a root that grows into the ground. They shave it, they squeeze the shavings and get drops of water. Another way, they learn where the water spots are from the animals. There's a story of an Af of a African bushman traveling through the Kalahari Desert. And as he was walking, he didn't carry much water with him. But he wasn't worried because he knew how to find water. So as he was walking, he knew it was going to be time to get some water. And he came up to an area of trees. He saw some baboons there. And he knew this was his opportunity. Baboons always know where the water sources are in the desert. The animals know where the water sources are, right? How can animals live in a desert if they don't know where the water is? They got to drink. So he did something very intelligent, and this is what many of the Bushmen do. They have these tricks to help get the animals to show them where the water sources are. He made sure the baboon was kind of in, within distance of watching what he was doing, and he went to a large ant hill. You've seen those large ant hills in Africa and the deserts, and he took a stick and started chipping away a hole on the side of the ant hill. And he chipped away a, a, a small hole the size of the stick. And then he grabbed something from his hand and made sure to flash it before the baboons who were watching intently, curiously. And he grabbed some melon seeds and he lowered them one by one into that little hole. And baboons are very curious animals, but they're afraid of humans. So the, the bushman, he went away far enough and just watched and just sat there. And uh, the baboon was looking around, and sure enough, as time came, he went over there to the hole, and he was looking and, you know, looked inside and uh, stuck his hand inside, and whew, he could feel it. Melons, he seeds. He knew it was some seeds. They love seeds. And he could feel those seeds, and he was grabbing them, trying to pull them out, but the problem was the hole was big enough for his hand to go out in, but not big enough for his fist to come out. So he couldn't pull his fist out, and he was struggling and trying, and the bushman rushed over there, grabbed some rope, and the baboon was trying and trying and trying, squeezing and flipped upside down, actually, trying to get out, but he didn't. And the bushman tied him, and then he let go. The baboon let go of those seeds, and the bushman came and tied him to a tree. And then the bushman pulled out a few clumps of salt. You know animals love salt. Do you know that they have salt licks for horses? For cows, big salt containers, they love it. And baboons, he put those few salt pieces next to him and the baboon just looked at it and whew, he loved it. He started licking the salt. He forgot he was even tied up. He was having so much fun. The bushman camped and slept over that night. And uh, the next morning, by that time, that, that baboon was very thirsty. <laughs> he had eaten three clumps of salt. And by now, the baboon did not care whether or not he wanted to hide the water source anymore. He didn't care if a human would find where the water source is. So the bushman untied the baboon. And whew, his mouth was thirsty. He was thirsty. What do you think he did? He started running to water. He needed water. And the bushman followed him, up, followed him into some rocks. And the baboon went down into a hole that you could go into a cave, a small opening. The bushman went through the opening, and the camera showed inside that cave was a beautiful pool of water. And that's how the Bushmen found where the water was. Now to this story of the baboon, 
Unfortunately, many times we are like the baboon. We are holding on to our sins. We are holding on to our addictions. We are holding on to little pleasures. Things that we think, oh, this is great. I want to enjoy the pleasures of sin. But they're holding us down. They're tying us down. And we don't want to let go. We don't want to pull our fist out. God has something so much better for us. A heaven of joy, of peace, of love. But we need to let go of the sins and the things that are holding us to this earth and give our hands to Jesus Christ. You and I can be ready for Jesus to come today. And I want us to read this, I want us to read this final quote for the end that says, I point you to the cross of Calvary. I ask you to consider the infinite sacrifice made in your behalf. Whose behalf? My behalf. That through faith in Jesus Christ, you may not perish but have everlasting life. All heaven was given us in Jesus Christ. Oh, honor Jesus by giving to him the heart's best and holiest services. He has given his life for you. Who is he that had done this? The only begotten Son of God, he that was one with the Father before the world was. Have you considered the infinite sacrifice made on your behalf? Have you considered that Jesus came and left heaven above, risked losing his life, eternally, so that you and I can have eternal life? Are you ready to come and give your heart to Jesus today? Are you ready to give him your life right now? If you surrender your life to Christ, if you have faith in him, if you believe that he is your savior, and look to him and maintain that connection with him, walking with him, do you know? that you can be ready for him to come today. We all can be ready for him to come today, right now. May God help us to make that decision to give our lives to him and to maintain that connection with him. That's my wish and prayer for all of us today. Amen. Amen.